This is Buckingham Palace, the official residence of Elizabeth II, the reigning queen of the United Kingdom. Situated in the heart of England's capital city, London, it attracts millions of tourists each year, drawn to the buildings and monuments that embody the identity of a nation and its heritage. And nearby is the most important royal church in the country, Westminster Abbey, that's witnessed the crowning of 38 kings and queens. The first was Elizabeth's distant ancestor, William the Conqueror, who reigned over these lands almost a thousand years ago. The influence of royalty could be seen in every corner of Britain and has left a lasting legacy in the landscape from castles and cathedrals to grand palaces and monuments. And within each lie extraordinary tales of battles and executions, romance and celebration. The monarchy of England and the United Kingdom is one of the most famous institutions in the world. And its kings and queens, princes and princesses, royal dukes and duchesses have all played a part in the rich history of royal Britain. The monarchs of the medieval era held the solemn belief that they were chosen and protected by God. But in reality, it was guile and military might that determined who ruled this coveted island. And for the 11th century King Harold, life was one long struggle against those who wished to depose and replace him. Having defeated the Vikings here in the north of England, the Saxon king marched his battle-weary army south, where a more formidable pretender to the throne awaited him. A Norman duke, destined to become the king of England and best known as William the Conqueror. His massive invasion force had sailed from France and landed here at Pevensey Bay, before being led to this field where the famous Battle of Hastings took place in September 1066. Harold, the Saxon king, was slain with an arrow through his eye on this ridge, where William later built an abbey to celebrate his victory. Once William the Conqueror was crowned king, he set about building castles, the likes of which had never been seen by the fear-struck people of England. Many of the ruins of these fortresses can still be seen today. William intended such places to instill fear of the new order, and they rapidly consolidated his oppressive hold on the country. Within the massive stone walls, a terrible death by torture awaited any who opposed the king. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, A History of the Times, says of the Normans, they filled the whole land with these castles, and when they were made, they filled the castles with devils and wicked men. The best known and best preserved is the Tower of London. Dominating the skyline at the time, it served as a symbol of the king's power. Within 20 years of the Battle of Hastings, 49 major castles had been built. By King William's death, fortresses were rising up all over the country. And less than 100 years later, a new dynasty came to the throne and a new king, Henry II. An able ruler, he set out to unify the land as well as restore law and order. Despite some tremendous achievements, Henry is best remembered for a terrible misunderstanding which led to a bloody murder within the walls of England's most important religious building, Canterbury Cathedral. 
To reorganize the criminal justice system of the time, Henry needed the cooperation of the all-powerful church. As king, he was able to appoint his best friend and chancellor, Thomas Becket, as Archbishop of Canterbury Cathedral, the highest clerical position in medieval England. Before long, a bitter rift formed between the two, and known for his short temper, Henry is said to have exclaimed, will no one rid me of this troublesome priest? Taking his outburst literally, four of his knights took it upon themselves to carry out the king's wish. On the 29th of December, 1170, they rode out to the cathedral where they brutally murdered Becket. He was declared a martyr and a saint by the Pope in Rome. Henry sought penance for the killing of his friend by walking barefoot through the streets of Canterbury. At the cathedral, he prayed while monks beat him with branches. Unfortunately for Henry, his problems didn't end there. In the years to come, there were bitter disputes with his wife and four sons over territory that extended across the seas to Ireland and to France. But it was an empire that rapidly collapsed under the rule of his youngest and favourite son, John, at the turn of the 12th century. A largely unpopular king, John I developed a reputation as a spiteful and cruel ruler. Centuries later, he was to become the arch-villain in the Robin Hood legends. The ultimate blow to his pride must have been when he lost the crown jewels. It happened here in the Wash, one of Britain's largest estuaries. Faced with a rampaging French army and rebelling nobles, stories tell of King John's lumbering baggage train crossing these tidal mudflats. Packhorses and wagons were carrying, amongst other things, the crown jewels. When the waters rushed back in, the royal treasures were swept away, leaving the king devastated. With his spirit broken, John fell ill and died within a week of the incident. his body was laid to rest at Worcester Cathedral. Today, the marble top of his tomb is the lid of his original coffin and thought to be the oldest royal effigy in England. King John had left the country in a state of chaos and anarchy, with London already under French control. Fearing the crown would now fall into foreign hands, John's nine-year-old son, Henry, was rushed to Gloucester Cathedral to be made King of England on the 28th of October, 1216. It was a quick and simple coronation, attended by only a handful of noblemen and bishops. And since the actual crown had been lost in the wash by his father, a simple gold band was placed on the child's head. For poor Henry III, it was the beginning of a long and troubled reign. It was the warrior king Edward I who finally brought peace to England. And once that was done, he set out to claim the rest of Britain. In 1277, Edward invaded Wales with a massive army, forcing the Welsh prince to surrender. To serve as a symbol of English dominance over the Welsh, he built a royal seat of power, Carnarvon Castle. Proclaimed the Welsh capital, Carnarvon was built with grand accommodation intended for future English royals. And it's also here that Edward founded the tradition for the title of Prince of Wales to be given to the eldest son of the English monarch. 
One famous story is that King Edward, in order to appease the Welsh, had promised a prince born in Wales who did not speak a word of English. Keeping his pledge, the king produced a son born within these walls who, being a baby, couldn't yet speak a word of English, or any other language for that matter. But this wasn't sufficient to stop countless Welsh uprisings. Edward had prepared for this by building a series of fortresses to encircle and subdue the Welsh, as well as protect the new English settlers. These castles came to be known as the infamous Ring of Iron. It was the biggest military building project of medieval Europe, culminating in Edward's most ambitious and innovative castle, Beaumaris. No expense was to be spared. Work started in 1295 and continued for 35 years, with over 3,500 workmen employed at the peak of construction. As well as a moat and numerous arrow slits, the entrances were protected by holes from which hot oil could be poured over Welsh attackers. However, the castle was never actually completed, and what we see today aren't so much ruins as work that was in progress until money simply ran out, when the king turned his attention to the wars in Scotland. Unlike Wales, the outright conquest of Scotland eluded the elderly king, right up until his death near the Scottish border on the way to battle. It was a fitting end to one of the greatest military commanders of the Middle Ages. In stark contrast, his son and heir, Prince Edward of Carnarvon, died in a prison cell here at Barclay Castle. More interested in leisure activities than the art of war, Edward was deposed by his wife and her lover and held here for five months before his grisly murder in 1327. Although the identity of his assailant was never revealed, it's said that Edward met his end painfully with a red-hot poker. The cell where he's supposed to have been imprisoned and murdered can still be seen, along with the adjacent 11 metre deep dungeon, which, according to legend, echoes with Edward's screams every year on September the 21st. The murdered king had left a son and heir to the throne, Edward III, in whose name his mother, the queen, and her lover, Roger Mortimer, ruled. It was here at York Minster that they married Edward at age 15 to 13-year-old heiress Philippa for a vast dowry. The Queen was secretly planning to use the money to fund an invasion force which would overthrow her son. However, the boy had been fond of his ill-fated father and little did the scheming couple know Edward would be their undoing just days before his 18th birthday. One night in October 1330, he entered Nottingham Castle through a subterranean passage and arrested both Roger Mortimer and the Queen, who is said to have pleaded, fair son, have pity on the gentle Mortimer. However, Mortimer was transported to London and duly hanged on the site where Marble Arch now stands. He was charged with treason as well as the murder of young Edward's father, the former king. His mother was sent to Castle Rising in Norfolk, where she spent the remainder of her life. These are the remains of one of the greatest palace fortresses in England, Kenilworth Castle. Linked with some of the most important royals in British history, it was the favourite residence of the 15th century king, Henry V. 
Here, in 1414, Henry, then aged 28, famously received a curious gift from the French king, a box of tennis balls. The intention was to openly mock Henry as an immature youth rather than a worthy monarch. But the prank was to backfire horribly for the French king, Charles VI. It's said that the insult incited Henry to lead his army to victory at the notoriously bloody Battle of Agincourt in France, which eventually led to Henry's claim to the French throne. But England's glory was to be short-lived. By the mid-1400s, the country slipped into a massive slump and tensions grew between two powerful royal dynasties. The House of York and the House of Lancaster. Each claimed its right to the throne, and for three decades they battled over the crown, which passed back and forth between the rivals no less than five times. The fighting came to be known as the Wars of the Roses after the emblems that represented the two houses. At the centre of the fighting were the great military strongholds that were the scenes of numerous battles, revolts and sieges. And the ruins of many of these royal fortresses still stand. The royal castle at Bamber rears up on a rocky plateau looking out over the North Sea. It was originally built to defend the north of England against the Scots. But during the Wars of the Roses, Bamber served as a key stronghold for the Lancastrians, who fiercely resisted wave upon wave of attacks by the Yorkist army of Edward IV. Despite a lengthy siege, the medieval castle proved no match for a new generation of weapon, the cannon. Yorkists bombarded the fortress walls with their great guns, and the garrison eventually surrendered. Bamber was one of the first castles in England to be defeated by artillery. Though Henry VI of Lancaster managed to flee the castle, its commander was pulled out from under the rubble and executed as a traitor. In the following centuries, much of Bamber Castle was restored and rebuilt. In the Wars of the Roses, gunpowder proved to be a force able to ravage almost any stronghold. Here at Annick Castle, the Lancastrian Earl of Northumberland surrendered to the Yorkists after watching just seven cannonballs hit his massive walls. Today, this magnificent castle might seem familiar. It stands in as Hogwarts Academy in the early Harry Potter films. It's in the background during Harry's first flying lesson on his broomstick. Annick remains the family home of the Dukes of Northumberland, making it one of the largest inhabited castles in Europe. Only the mighty Harlick Castle on the west coast of Wales managed to hold out until the bitter end against the House of York, surrendering after a seven-year siege, the longest siege in the history of Britain. One likely reason it was able to resist being taken for so long was because the waters back in the 15th century may have actually lapped the cliffs on which the castle sits. This not only added protection, but also enabled supplies to get to Harnick by boat. But the most extraordinary thing about the siege was that the castle was defended by just 40 men against an army of a thousand English soldiers. They became known as the Men of Harlick, inspiring a famous song that's still a national rallying point for the Welsh today. This last battle consolidated the reign of the Yorkist king, Edward IV. 
There were no further rebellions after Edward's restoration to the throne, and the Lancastrian line had virtually been extinguished. The only rival left was Henry Tudor, who was living in exile. It wouldn't be until Edward IV's death in 1483 that England's monarchy would once more be plunged into turmoil. This grand medieval ruin is Ludlow Castle, set in the picturesque English county of Shropshire. It's now best known for outdoor Shakespeare plays, as well as its annual food and drink festival held in the grounds. But during the Wars of the Roses, this fortified royal palace was the principal seat for the House of York. It was also where Edward IV's 12-year-old son and heir, the Prince of Wales, was being raised and educated. When word reached Ludlow of the King's death, it triggered a chain of events that ultimately led to the mysterious disappearance of the Prince and his younger brother, something that has forever intrigued historians, the story of the Princes in the Tower. They had been under the protection of their uncle, Richard, Duke of York, who was to escort the boy king and his brother to London for the coronation. But the crowning never took place, since their uncle wanted the throne for himself. The boys were staying here at the Tower of London, while it was declared that the princes were in fact illegitimate, making the rightful heir their uncle, Richard. Soon after, the two young princes were seen playing outside the tower. This was the last recorded sighting of the boys before their disappearance. It was widely believed that they were murdered by their uncle, the newly crowned Richard III, who came to be known as the Hunchback King. But his reign lasted only two years, before the re-emergence of the House of Lancaster and his exiled enemy, Henry Tudor. The final and dramatic confrontation between the two houses of York and Lancaster took place on August the 22nd, 1485, in central England. This flag marks the Battle of Bosworth Field where 15,000 men fought for the future of England. On one side was 32-year-old King Richard III, and on the other, Henry Tudor, aged 28. Henry, having rallied an army of 5,000 soldiers, was still outnumbered two to one. He also knew that a victory wasn't enough. Only the death of Richard would present him as the new monarch. The engagement was fierce and bloody. Accounts tell of Richard fighting bravely and even coming within a sword's length of Henry before finally being surrounded and slain. His crown was taken from his dead body and placed on Henry Tudor's head, proclaiming him King Henry VII. His victory heralded the new dynasty of the Tudors, a 117-year reign which brought enormous change to the country, as well as great wealth and power. But if the new king, Henry VII, thought he'd have a peaceful time when he came to the throne, he was mistaken. Powerful English lords control vast areas of the country from their imposing castles, which dominated the landscape. Many of these aristocratic families had had their castles and estates taken into royal hands following their defeat at the Battle of Bosworth Field. And so Henry had no shortage of enemies. Throughout his 24-year reign, there were plots, rebellions and pretenders to the throne to deal with. Executions were common. 
But despite these problems, Henry started what the Tudors would be good at, the concentration of power in the hands of the dynasty. He died in 1509 and was succeeded by his son, Henry VIII. And it was under Henry that England would become a more settled and united country. As a result, there was a decline of castles and the first flowering of great Tudor houses that were designed for comfort rather than defence. This can be seen at Compton Winniets in the English county of Warwickshire. One of the first great Tudor houses, it was built by William Compton, a boyhood friend of Henry VIII, who gave him an old nearby castle. William tore it down and incorporated much of the original in his new house, which is how it kept a castle look. The roof line has a Tudor trademark that can be seen on countless houses throughout the period. Fantastic chimneys in all shapes, sizes and designs. King Henry VIII stayed many times at Compton Winniards and his bedroom window still has the king's coat of arms in stained glass. But there was one house being built that was so opulent and audacious that it even made the king envious. A house that was to be the new home of his eminence, Cardinal Wolsey. After Henry VIII, he was the most powerful man in the land and the king's closest advisor. As a result, he was able, through patronage and corruption, to become immensely rich and build one of the grandest palaces ever seen in England, Hampton Court. In this enormous house, he could entertain on a lavish scale. It rivaled Henry's court and it angered the king. Wolsey's eventual downfall came when he failed to persuade the Pope in Rome to grant Henry a divorce from his first wife because she couldn't present him with a son. As he felt power slipping from his hands, Wolsey offered the king his house. Henry took it and eventually had Wolsey arrested, but he died before Henry could execute him. The woman who Henry desired and wanted to marry was Anne Boleyn. She was to become the second of Henry's six wives and the mother of the future Queen Elizabeth I. It's likely she was born here at Blickling Hall in the east of England. Anne's eventual marriage to the king had been engineered by her family and powerful friends who stood to gain from her becoming queen. They had seen how Henry looked at her and increasingly desired her. This relationship was to cause one of the biggest upheavals in English history, the break with the Pope in Rome and a new English religion. But marriage to Henry was to eventually cost Anne Boleyn her head, when, like his first wife, she failed to present the king with a son. In London, she was tried for adultery, incest and treason and executed here at the Tower of London. Blindfolded and kneeling upright in the French manner, the executioner shouted, where's my sword, to distract her, and then severed her head in one blow. These are the ruins of Fountains Abbey in the north of England. It's not ruined through neglect, but because Henry VIII ordered its destruction. When Henry sought a divorce in order to marry Anne Boleyn, he was refused by the powerful Catholic Church. When, in a defiant act, the marriage went ahead, the Pope in Rome excommunicated Henry, such that his soul would be condemned to hell. The result was a bitter confrontation between Henry and the Roman Catholic Church. Henry saw his opportunity to take all the church treasure. In 1539, the king's men approached Fountains Abbey in Yorkshire and forcibly looted the monastery and then left the buildings to demolition gangs. 
For nearly 1,500 years, England had been a Catholic country. Henry destroyed that over his simple desire for a pretty young girl and a male heir to succeed him. What became known as the dissolution of the monasteries followed, with the destruction of 800 large religious buildings. Monasteries like Whitby Abbey in the north of England had grown very rich and powerful over the centuries. In 1540, they lost everything. Where monks resisted this desecration, they were often cruelly put to death, as a gruesome reminder to others not to resist the king. The king's defiance of the Pope created waves across Catholic Europe. France and Spain, supported by Rome, threatened to force England back into the bosom of the true faith. Fearing an invasion, Henry VIII began a building program to strengthen coastal defences. On the island of Lindisfarne, off the coast of Northumberland, the stones from a nearby ruined abbey went to build a new style of castle on a rocky crag. The castle, now converted into a house, is more of a small military fort. And one of the reasons for this change was the development of artillery, which meant the end of the old-style fortresses like Bamber Castle. Its sheer size made it an easy target for cannon fire. It meant a new design of castle was needed. These would be low-lying, more compact, and as a result difficult to see and hit. Henry built 20 of them along the south coast, facing France along the English Channel. Deal Castle is a superb example. These forts used powerful new cannon to destroy an enemy before they landed on the beach. They also had the ability to defend an attack from land. The design is in the shape of two clover leaves, one larger than the other. This pattern creates 145 openings for cannon and firearms. This was a castle built purely for defence and not for living in. In fact, the castle was so efficient that it took only one officer and 24 soldiers to run it. Two more Tudor castles that still survive were built to protect Falmouth Harbour in the southwest of the country, which was an important Tudor naval port. St Moore's Castle on the east side and Pendennis Castle on the west. They were both capable of blowing an enemy ship out of the water if it tried to enter the harbour. All along the south coast, there are examples of these impressive forts. Henry VIII's reign also marked the birth of English naval power. In 1540, he built the first naval dock in Britain at Portsmouth, and it's been home to the Royal Navy ever since. Its Tudor heritage can still be seen in the fortresses that guarded these waters. South Sea Castle is situated on a headland outside the harbour entrance, as this was a perfect position to protect the harbour from any invading ships. The River Thames was also a key location for shipbuilding. Given Henry's fascination and love of warships, he'd frequently visit the dockyards not far from his favourite palace at Greenwich. The Tudor Palace was demolished in the 17th century. The old Royal Naval College now stands on the site that was originally the birthplace of both Henry and his daughter, Elizabeth. In 1558, Elizabeth I became Queen of England. She'd dominate the age and become one of England's most successful and loved monarchs. But as a Protestant, Elizabeth, like her father Henry VIII, became the enemy of Catholic Europe, which included 
elements of Scotland. These rare Tudor fortifications near the border at Berwick-upon-Tweed show how determined Queen Elizabeth was to prevent a possible Scottish invasion. The threat came from Elizabeth's cousin, who lived here at Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh in Scotland. She was Mary Queen of Scots and stood to succeed to the English throne should Elizabeth die childless. As a Catholic, Mary considered herself the rightful Queen of England, and as a result, she and Elizabeth became bitter enemies. But it would be Mary whose plight would end in tragedy. Under suspicion of her intention to overthrow Elizabeth, Mary was abducted by Scottish nobles and held in the island castle on Loch Leven. With the help of her jailer's son, who was smitten by her beauty, she was secretly rowed to safety, where she rallied her supporters for one last battle. She lost and fled across the border to England, hoping for mercy from her cousin and bitter rival, Elizabeth. She was to be disappointed, and over the next 18 years was held prisoner in a succession of northern castles, including Bolton in Northumberland, where she lived for a year while her fate was being decided. Finally, after accusations of plots against Elizabeth, she was put on trial and executed. It said that when Mary's executioner asked for forgiveness, she replied, I forgive you with all my heart, for now I hope you shall make an end to all my troubles. With her throne secure, Elizabeth's power and prestige grew, but curiously, she was also noted for her careful spending. The Queen built no palaces for herself. Instead, eminent households like Ingotstone in Essex and Burley in Cambridgeshire would be granted the honour of inviting the Queen and her massive entourage. Lavish entertainment was always expected and the costs were vast. But many nobles begged off the pleasure of her stay for fear of bankruptcy. Others saw it as an opportunity to boost their social status and built grand houses specifically for the occasion. Like Kirby Hall, largely designed to entice the Queen, but after spending a fortune on expensive glass and fine gardens, she never came. Today, Kirby Hall lies in ruins. The family simply couldn't maintain the upkeep and eventually lost their wealth to gambling, and the house was left to rot. It's since become an historic site, and the formal garden has been restored. For Elizabeth, the threat of an invasion from Europe continued to loom large on the horizon. The Spanish king saw the Protestant Elizabeth as a heretic, and with the Pope's blessing, an armada of 130 ships set sail from Spain for England in the summer of 1588. When the fleet was first sighted off St Michael's Mount in Cornwall, a fire was lit on the church roof to signal an invasion. Visible for miles, a rapid succession of similar beacons were lit, alerting not only the naval bases, but also Elizabeth in London, that England was about to be attacked. The response was swift and decisive, and proved disastrous for the slow and cumbersome Spanish Armada, which was no match for the small and manoeuvrable English ships. Moreover, a vicious storm drove the Spanish into the dangerous waters of the Pentland Firth in Scotland, where looming cliffs and rocks awaited them. It was thought that up to 20,000 Spanish sailors and soldiers died, and the failed invasion has gone down in history as one of the worst ever naval disasters.
However, it was a celebrated victory for Elizabeth and one that defined England as one of the most powerful nations of the Tudor age. When the Queen died in 1603, the age of the absolute rule of the monarch died with her. Because a new power was emerging in London that rejected the King or Queen's divine right to rule. This is the Palace of Westminster, just as it is today, it was in the 17th century the seat of Parliament. It was their role to pass laws and raise taxes for the monarch. But soon, anger and resentment grew amongst the wealthy and influential politicians that made up the assembly. Their issue was over the frequent abuse of power exercised by Elizabeth's successors. It ultimately led to the Civil War of 1642, resulting in the beheading of Charles I. With the monarchy removed, his son, also Charles, was forced to flee for his life. He famously sought refuge at Boscobel, hiding first in a tree, which is now known as the Royal Oak, and then spending the night in the attic of the house. Charles then travelled on in disguise via other safe houses before escaping to France. After an 11-year spell of England as a republic, Parliament decided to restore the monarchy, albeit in a much weaker form. The age of the monarch's absolute power was over, but with the restoration came a new era of architecture inspired by the great royal buildings of Europe like St Paul's Cathedral in London. Charles had returned as king to public acclaim. And in this air of optimism, he was determined to match the grandeur of anything he'd seen in Europe whilst in exile. He commissioned the undisputed genius, Sir Christopher Wren, to rebuild the Gothic St Paul's Cathedral after it was burnt down during the Great Fire of London in 1666. The taste for the new proved irresistible for the royals, and when Protestant William and Mary came to the throne from the Netherlands, following the removal of Charles's Catholic brother James from the throne, they employed Wren to extend Hampton Court in the new Dutch style. They produced no heir, nor did the next monarch, Mary's sister, Queen Anne, and as a result, the crown passed to the next closest relative, who came from the House of Hanover in Germany. This led to four kings named George and over a hundred years of what has become known as the Georgian period. And nothing typifies this era more than the city of Bath. This was the most fashionable place to be seen during much of the 18th century and most members of the royal family spent time here taking the waters for their health as well as enjoying the social life. The city is a Georgian creation and adopted the classical style of ancient Rome, which dominated this period. Great curving terraces were built into the hillside and even included the circus, which was an idealised version of the Colosseum in Rome. This classical style dominated the new Georgian houses being built, which form many of today's finest country houses. This was a period of great prosperity where fortunes were made as the British Empire began to expand around the world. And with great wealth, the future George IV had no trouble spending it on extravagant buildings. This is the Royal Pavilion at Brighton. The fantasy Indian-style pleasure palace, with its onion domes and minarets, is a lasting testament to the self-indulgence of one of the most unpopular monarchs in British history. He built the pavilion as a retreat from London. 
here in the coastal town of Brighton, he was well away from the scrutiny of parliamentarians who viewed his extravagance and decadent lifestyle as a mark of social injustice and a waste of public money, particularly at a time when Britain was at war with Napoleon in France. But in London, we see another side to the Prince Regent. He was passionate in his patronage of arts and architecture. And many of his achievements can still be seen today in many of the capital's landmarks, like Regent's Park and the rebuilding and enhancement of the British Museum, the Tower of London, and Buckingham Palace, which his father had bought from the Duke of Buckingham in 1761. But a new era was ushered in on the 20th of June, 1837, when a young 18-year-old girl was woken at 6 a.m. in Kensington Palace to be told that she had become queen. Her name was Victoria. She later married a cousin from Germany, with whom she'd fallen in love as a girl, Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. As a passionate reformer, he was to influence many parts of London and was deeply committed to public causes. The world-famous Royal Albert Hall, which opened its doors in 1871, was part of his vision to promote culture and education. It's situated alongside a whole host of renowned institutions, colleges and museums that he commissioned. They're collectively and affectionately known as Albertopolis. And just to the north of the Albert Hall lies the highly ornate Albert Memorial. Erected a short while after the Prince's sudden and unexpected death from typhoid in 1861, aged only 42. Grief-stricken Queen Victoria never recovered from the loss of her husband. She spent increasing periods at Balmoral in Scotland. Albert had designed and closely supervised the construction of this grand baronial-style castle to serve as their summer residence. And it was here that Victoria began to depend on a local servant, John Brown, who became one of her closest companions during her long period of mourning. After her husband's death, Queen Victoria reigned for a further 40 years, a period marked by a great expansion of the British Empire. She spent her last days here on the Isle of Wight at Osborne House, that had been once again designed by her long departed husband. Victoria died in 1901 as the longest serving female monarch in history. A reign of over 63 years. In 1932, it was here at the royal residence of Sandringham that Victoria's grandson, George V, started the Christmas Day tradition of broadcasting to the empire. He had abandoned his father's German surname of Saxkeberg and Gotha in favour of the more English-sounding name of Windsor. It was considered the best thing to do, given the anti-German sentiment at the time. And it's the House of Windsor that's reigned over the United Kingdom since 1917. Many royal events have marked this period not least the abdication of the current Queen Elizabeth's uncle, Edward VIII, because he wished to marry an American divorcee. And the stammering address given by Elizabeth's father, George VI, made famous in the 2010 film, The King's Speech, on the site of the old Wembley Stadium. In 1952, Elizabeth was the 38th monarch to be crowned at Westminster Abbey, almost 900 years after her distant ancestor, William the Conqueror. And 
most recently, in 2011, the royal wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton was watched by hundreds of millions of people worldwide. And we end our story of Royal Britain at the medieval palace whose name was adopted by the present royal family, Windsor Castle. As the Queen's preferred weekend home, it's the oldest and largest inhabited castle in the world, where today over 500 people live and work. It's here that the present monarchy is truly linked with its past, with a history going back almost a thousand years. Originally built by William the Conqueror after his invasion of England, it's been a royal residence ever since, and the final resting place of ten monarchs, including Henry VIII and his favourite queen, Jane Seymour. Elizabeth I entertained dignitaries here, and for a while it was even used by parliamentarians during the English Civil War as a prison to hold Charles I before his beheading. The extravagant George IV rebuilt the castle at vast expense, and it was the refuge for the royal family during the bombing campaigns of World War II. And after centuries of trials and tribulations, this great castle continues to thrive. A fitting place to end this story of royal Britain.